Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. For this evening, we're going to be doing something that's somewhat ambitious, but it's just because I, I combined these two merely because there's, there's very little difference in the sort of line of thinking that's going on. Really, about the second half of Hebrews 3 all the way through the end of Hebrews 5 could be one chapter, honestly. I realize that they broke it up for convenience, but there's really one line of argumentation and one line of thought that strings from right around the end of Hebrews 3 all the way to the end of verse 5. And so uh, it's really about three and a half or two and a half chapters there that could, could all kind of be one chapter, honestly. So what I've done tonight is when we're looking at part 5, discussing the great high priest, we're going to try to get through both chapters 4 and 5. Now, considering that I'm the teacher, that may be a little too ambitious. Uh, we know that I, I tend to like to talk, uh, but we're going to try to get through that and, and sort of entertain this. And before we really dive into the scripture, I do want to just kind of set the table and remind us of what was going on at the end of chapter 3, because like I said, you could kind of see that they bleed over into one another. So, so far in Hebrews We've already seen this idea of Jesus being the high priest, at least introduced and kind of teased a little bit in some earlier passages. Twice he's mentioned the idea of Jesus being the high priest. And this is an idea that is going to go all the way through chapter 10. So he's going to visit it heavily here in this passage, and then he's even going to come back to it a couple of times after that as well. So we're really going to be zeroing in tonight on the idea of the high priest. And this is something that he was talking about in the previous chapter. You may remember last week, where we ended, he was making an analogy between the time of Moses and the entering of Canaan. And he was saying that those who believe and obey, those are the ones that do enter into the promised land in that story. And those who did not believe, who did not have faith, did not do what God asked them to do. The older generation, the ones that were over 20, they're the ones that lay dead in the wilderness because of their disobedience. And he's sort of making that analogy to the people that are reading Hebrews now. He says, don't, don't think that you're better than the children of Israel. You will meet the same fate on the spiritual level if that takes place. And really, there's no break in thought between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, as we'll see when we read the first few verses here, that he continues on with this idea of the church and the people in the modern era. And of course, when I say modern, I mean modern for his time, the first century. Uh, people in the modern era, there is no difference between them and the generation of Israelites that were entering into Canaan. He says, some of you that are unfaithful are going to be left behind. If you do not keep to the covenant that you have made with Jesus Christ, you have to continue that. And so we see that continue in chapter 4, where the Hebrew author says, Therefore we must fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached us, just as, they did also, just as they also did. But the word they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united with those who listened with faith. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, As I swore in my anger, they certainly shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished, from the foundation of the world. Now remember that we saw this exact same scripture from the Old Testament quoted last week. As I swore in my anger, they will certainly not enter my rest. And the Hebrew author is really attesting to that again. He's sort of uh, bringing that, that same idea and that same line of thinking back up again, where he says, you will not be entering the rest if you do not have faith and obedience and continue on in the covenant that you have made with Christ. And it's really interesting that he looks uh, in that, that phrase in verse 2 where he says, we have had good news preached to us. The fact that Jesus has come and died for our sins to offer us forgiveness and salvation, that is good news. Guess what? The Israelites also had good news preached to them, that they were going to enter the land, they were going to have God behind them, that they were going to have the blessings of a land overflowing with milk and honey, they were going to have prosperity, God was going to take care of them, they were going to be His special people that was set forth on this earth to bless all of mankind. Did that good news do them any good? 
not to the ones that didn't listen to it. And the exact same thing is being portrayed here. He's saying, you've had the gospel preached to you. That's a good thing. But if you don't do anything about it, if you don't change who you are, if it doesn't transform you, it's going to have the same effect it did to what we were talking about at the end of chapter 3 last week. You're going to be the dead body in the wilderness. That's what's going to happen here. And so he's drawing this correlation here very aptly, saying that it's great that you've had the good news preached, but it's not going to do you any good unless you actually heed it and listen to it and obey it, just like the covenants of old. And so if you look at verse 1 and it talks about the promise, I think it's interesting the way that this is worded because it very much gives off the idea that the rest exists regardless of how people react to it. And we understand that. That makes sense to us. Because if you are going with this analogy of the rest being the promised land, being the blessing of God's covenant, then we understand that with the eternal rest that is being discussed here in this passage, that there is a correlation between the two. Did the promised land cease to exist because the children of Israel were not obeying God's covenant? No, the, the promised land was still there. Like, it, it never changed. It was still a land of blessing. It was still a land of abundance. In fact, the Canaanites that were occupying it liked it a lot. That's the reason they didn't want to leave. So the promised land and God's rest are both concepts that exist and are there. The question is, do the people take advantage of it? And I do think that it's kind of funny that especially those that scoff at the scriptures. This is a very common criticism of God about how God is so unfair. Well, a loving God would never send somebody to hell. Guys, the rest is there. The promised land is there. It's made available to us. It's a free gift. The fact that there are some people that refuse to take advantage of it is not God's fault. And so that's one thing that this verse really points out. There are going to be people that do not take advantage of God's mercy, that do not go through the process of becoming a Christian and knowing Christ and coming to the Father and living with Him eternally. That is going to happen. That's a reality. But that's not a commentary on God's fairness. Like God has made arrangements for us. The fact that there are people that refuse to take advantage of it does not mean that God is unfair or unjust or uncompassionate. And in fact, this case is going to be made in this very passage. Um, and one thing that I also do want to bring up, this correlation between the land being one of two things, this is actually something that's recurrent throughout the Pentateuch. And so I actually did a term paper on this last semester, this idea of land in the Pentateuch. I had an introduction to Pentateuch class. And the thing that I kept bringing up, because I kept seeing this theme occur over and over and over, is that you got two choices. You can obey God and have blessing, or you can disobey God and have curse. And that usually takes the form of, in the Old Testament, land. Think about it. Adam has literally the best land you can imagine. He is in the Garden of Eden. It is paradise. Then he disobeys God. What happens to the land? It says that the land is not going to yield its fruit to you, that it will yield up weeds and tares and thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of your brow will you work. And it goes on with Cain. Cain is enjoying the fruits of the good land, and then he kills his brother, and then he is cast out. He is an outcast, an exile. He is no longer the beneficiary of the blessing of land. And then we see that occur in the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it, it happens over and over and over again. There's this idea that if you obey God, the land yields its blessing. If you do not, the land no longer has that. And then it becomes clear later in the Old Testament that it's not actually the land itself. It's the spiritual blessing of God that is really important here, that if you are obedient to God, regardless of where you are, God's blessing is upon you. And we see that, for example, in later writings like Daniel, so on and so forth. This same idea is really what's being presented here in Hebrews because he's calling back to this analogy of the children of Israel having this choice. They can live in the good land or the not good land. And it's all dependent upon how their relationship with God is.
And so the Hebrew author is drawing this metaphorical correlation between you have the opportunity to enter into God's rest if you are obedient with him, or you could also have the reality of not having those blessings if you choose not to. And so he's really drawing on the symbolism that would have been very, very familiar to people in the Old Testament. Let's go on and read the next few verses in verses 4 through 7. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they certainly shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who previously had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again sets a certain day, today, saying that through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, this is a passage we're all extremely familiar with. He's quoting Genesis here. Because what he says is that God rests on the seventh day, and he rests after his works. So, passage that we're familiar with, passage that they would have been familiar with. It's part of the, the Pentateuch and the Law of Moses. And so he's calling back to this idea as he's been doing for the past chapter of, you want to use Moses as your authority? Okay, I'll use Moses as your authority and I'll teach you the gospel through it. And so where he's talking here about God resting on the seventh day, rest only counts if you worked. If you're just laying around and not doing anything, that's not rest. That's laziness. Rest happens after you have worked, after you have done something productive, after you have done what you set out to do. After that happens, then you can experience rest. And that's the thing that he's kind of harping on here is, if you want to enter the rest, you have to do the thing that God has commanded you to do. And so I find that he's using this very interest, uh, he's using the words here in an interesting way. He's saying that, that there was a resting that happened on the seventh day. And then he calls back to another Old Testament passage where he says, and they shall not enter my rest. You may remember we actually read this full quotation last week, uh, that they are not going to enter my rest. So he's saying, you can't have rest if you don't have what, you've, what I've commanded you to do. That's part of the deal. If you do not keep my covenant, then you will not enter into my rest. And it's interesting to note here that the way that he talks about it He's calling back to the original rest. Like, he could go back to the law of Moses. We know that the Sabbath is there. It's part of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And so the Sabbath is a very prominent part of Judaism. But he's going back even further than that. He's going all the way back to the original day of rest. The Sabbath day that God experienced after he had finished his creation, which the Sabbath, of course, is based on. We know that. But the reason I think that he's drawing back on this idea of the rest that happened the first time instead of going back to the law of Moses and the, the rest that happened under the law and the covenant is because he's trying to present this idea that we just talked about a second ago that the rest is always present. The land of Canaan doesn't just go away because the Israelites were disobedient. The land is still there. It's that they didn't get to take advantage of it. And so in the same way, he's calling back to God's rest being eternal. That's something that has always existed. That's something that God always had planned for his creations. The rest is an eternal concept. It was there in Genesis. We know that it existed right after he created Adam and Eve. The rest was literally the next day. That's when it was instituted. And then we see it again in the Old Testament crop up over and over. We see the rest of Moses because, of course, the Sabbath is a part of the law of Moses. We see the rest in Joshua because Joshua is the one who brings them into the rest that he is talking about, the, the Canaan land. And then we have the Sabbath actually, because this is a quotation of a psalm by David, then we also see the same rest repeated in the Psalms of David. And so you've got four extremely prominent Old Testament characters that he's hearkening back to. And so it, he's kind of playing on this idea that we see throughout Hebrews is that he's referring to multiple periods in Old Testament history all at once because he's trying to give them an all-inclusive picture of if you want what the Old Testament has to offer, you look at Jesus, you look at the Gospels, you look at his teaching. And so if you want all of this idea of the Old Testament, 
the Old Testament is not the way to get there. You actually get there through Christ. And so he's quoting the Old Testament in that way as well, trying to, to make use of it so that they can understand exactly what is being discussed here. So let's go ahead and read Hebrews 4, 8 through 11. For, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Consequently, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let's make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience. Is anybody here reading that out of the King James? Is anyone using a King James? Wow, really nobody? I, man, I was really expecting at least one person to have a King James. Okay, well, uh, I was going to ask this question, but since no one seems to have a, a KJV on hand, uh, if you look in verse 8 there, where it says, for if Joshua had given them rest, if you look in a King James, it actually says, for if Jesus had given them rest. So why is the name Jesus there in an older translation like the KJV? That's exactly right. In Greek, it's the same name. And of course, we have Hebrews written in Greek originally. And so it uses the word Jesus there because Jesus is the Greek transliteration of Joshua. So when people are calling Jesus Jesus in the New Testament, the name that they're using is Yahshua, which is Joshua. And so they actually have the same name. You're exactly right there. So if that's the case, then really there's no way to distinguish between the two. They, they just have the same name. So here's the follow-up question. Here, does the author intend for you to understand that as Jesus Christ, or does he intend it to be talking about the Joshua of the Old Testament? So they are both servants of God, for sure. And he's speaking of Joshua in that role, right? He's talking about Joshua having given them rest. Well, what does Joshua, what does that name mean? It means he who saves his people. And so he saved the people by bringing them into the Canaan land. And so that's kind of the motif that you're talking about right there. And so that, that's an apt observation. And I do think that in this context, especially if you look at the, the later part of verse 8, it's clear that the Hebrew writer is trying to evoke the symbolism of Old Testament Joshua. But I do think, and this is the reason that he's bringing it up in the first place, is that he is doing so intentionally meaning Old Testament Joshua because he's about to compare Old Testament Joshua to New Testament Joshua, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. And so I don't think that there's any wordplay going on here. I don't think that he's doing, like, he didn't use a different form of the name intentionally to make it vague or make it like a pun. That's not what he's doing here because he just, he used the man's name because it's the same name. Uh, but he is intentionally calling upon the symbolism of Joshua because he's about to compare him to Jesus. And so it's interesting that that just happens to be the way that it works out here. And so he talks about Jesus being the one, or sorry, Joshua being the one who has given them rest. But if Joshua had given them true rest, then he would not have spoken another day after that. Like if, if Joshua had given the Israelites the perfect rest that God had intended, that'd be the end of the story, right? Like once they're, they're in Canaan and they're established, that's the end of the book of Joshua. Everybody, you know, turned the lights off and head home. But he's saying that's not what happened. Why? Why is it that Joshua was not able to end the story? Why did he not allow the Israelites to enter in that perfect rest? And then we don't hear anything else out of Israel because, you know, they just live the way that the covenant was. Well, it's because the people continue to be disobedient. And so what he's trying to convey here is, you've seen the Joshua of old give Israel rest. And he was actually able to accomplish God's purpose. And he just contrasted, you know, the bad Israelites, they're the ones that died in the wilderness. The good, faithful Israelites are the ones that went into Canaan and entered God's rest. That is true, kind of. And by that I mean, 
Yes, they were the better Israelites, and they were the ones that were trying to be faithful, but that wasn't the perfect rest that God had always intended for his people, because that's not the end of the story. So he's saying there is a, ne there is a necessity for a new Joshua to come along, and that new Joshua will lead his people into the perfect rest, the end of the story, the completion of God's plan, which, of course, is Jesus. So for those of you that are keeping score at home with, on your tally cards, uh, that means that so far we have this idea of Jesus is better than the angels, he is better than Abraham, he is better than Moses, he is better than Aaron, and he is better than Joshua. Okay, we've made it through the first six books of the Bible, so <laughs> we've already established that Jesus is better than all of those things just in the first half of the, the four chapters here. We're, we're not even into the middle of Hebrews, and we've already established those ideas. So uh, I want to go ahead and really quickly read Mark 2, 23 through 28, because I think it's pertinent here. And it happened that he, he talking about Jesus, of course, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abithathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except for the priest? And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over, over the Sabbath. Now, I don't want to get super technical here, but there is a running theory in theological circles of academics that Jesus was really not the Christ, and he was just like a wise teacher, and his uh, apostles kind of really embellished and romanticized and sort of made him into Christ afterward, and that only continued to get more legendary as time went on. And so th this is the same line of scholarship that thinks that Hebrews wasn't written by Paul or any apostle, and it was probably written like around 100, 120 A.D., and so the argument goes that the reason that you have passages like the one that we just read in Hebrews, where it's talking about Christ being better than the angels, higher than the angels, better than the Old Testament, that that's all that embellishment stuff that happens after what's known as the high Christology comes into place with the Hebrew author and the, the authors. And, and they say that you can look in the New Testament and see that the old writings from the New Testament have this very low Christology, they have the more real Jesus, and then Jesus becomes more fantastical and mythological and legendary the later writings that you read. Except what we just read in Mark, which by the way they argue is the earliest of the Gospels and one of the earliest books ever written in the New Testament. Jesus just called himself Lord of the Sabbath. And we see exactly the same Christology that occurs in Hebrews. And so this idea that Christ just sort of got mythologicalized, I just made up that word, um, this idea that he just sort of became this more fantastical, legendary uh, person the longer his legend grew, there's just no truth to it. We see exactly the same language used in the early New Testament books as in the later New Testament books. They may flesh the ideas out a little more, but the concepts are still there in the earlier New Testament writings. Now, I contend that Hebrews, of course, is much earlier anyway, but even if I didn't, this idea that the high Christology developed over time, there's just simply no truth to it. This idea that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and the Son of Man, these things are all there from the beginning. And the Hebrew author is specifically calling back to this passage, which the people that are reading this would have been familiar with, because it, it, Hebrews does come after the gospel, or at least the earliest gospels are written, probably somewhere close to around the time that John is penned. But regardless, um, when we're looking at that, we see this continuation of it. And so the high Christology is there even from the beginning. And so this idea that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath, that he's the one that gives mankind rest, and of course, 
this idea that Jesus is the one who instituted the original Sabbath even back right after Adam and Eve were created. That's something that is being talked about in Hebrews, but the concept of that didn't start in Hebrews, it started in Mark. It came from Jesus' own mouth. And so this isn't just inventing some kind of mythology later on. This is something that Jesus asserts even during his lifetime. And I do want to ask this because I think it's a really fascinating thing, and I don't want to get too far off track. But in this story where he talks about Lord of the Sabbath, I want to explore just for a second what that means. What is Jesus talking about when he's saying, I am Lord over the Sabbath? Is what Jesus saying here, because I think this is the way we often interpret it, is he saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, so I can break my own rules if I want to? Any thoughts on that? It, is that what Jesus is saying? Okay, he didn't break any rules. How did he not break the rules? Didn't he just violate the Sabbath? He worked on the Sabbath. He, he gathered grain. But are they really, though? Because it is actually commanded in the law of Moses that you're not supposed to work and harvest on the Sabbath. Like, I agree that there were a lot of extra rules where that analysis would pertain to this, but is that actually what's happening? Because in the Pentateuch, it does say you're not supposed to gather grain on the Sabbath. Yeah, that's exactly right. He's drawing this contrast between himself and David, and he's like, you guys wouldn't dare say anything bad about David, but here's an example of David actually doing something that clearly violates God's law. And what you were saying about Deuteronomy is correct, that you couldn't what they're talking about is you couldn't go out with a sickle and harvest grain with a tool and bring up big bushels of it to store in a barn. That's what is being talked about in the law of Moses. That's not what Jesus was doing here. The Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus in a technicality, which if you look at the technicality, actually he wasn't breaking it. So if you want to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here, what that rebuttal of being Lord of the Sabbath means, there's a great analogy that I have. For those of you that know me, you know I'm a huge fantasy nerd. So I love Lord of the Rings. It's one of my favorite books. And J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, a lot of people don't know this. His original draft of the first Lord of the Rings was rejected by an editor. And the reason that the editor rejected it is he said, you spelled dwarves wrong. It's supposed to have an F. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, you wrote it dwarves with a V. And Tolkien looked at him and said, Sir, I wrote the Oxford English Dictionary. Don't correct me. That's what Jesus is saying here. When he says I'm Lord of the Sabbath, he's not saying, Look, I can break my own rules if I want to. He's saying, You're going to cite the Sabbath to me? I was there when the first Sabbath happened. Now, he doesn't go into that level of detail, but that's what he's saying here. Uh, it's, it's very similar to that scene. I'm going to use another fantasy reference here. Uh, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where the, the white witch says that she has to have blood, and she's correct in this, by the way, uh, in order for the law to be fulfilled, and, he's, and she cites the deep magic, and Aslan says, don't cite the deep magic with me. I was there when it was written. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you guys don't understand. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I instituted it. I know what the rules are. I didn't break my own rules. And so the same idea that is being presented in Hebrews of him being Lord over all things is present in the Gospel of Mark. The Hebrew writer isn't going back and retroactively elevating Jesus to some lofty pedestal he never put himself on. He is asserting and affirming the teachings of Jesus Christ that were left behind by him from his own mouth. So let's look at the next few verses, uh, 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, even penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we must to whom we must answer. Okay, so he uses this symbolism of a sword. Why is a sword useful? What makes a sword a useful thing to have? Okay, you can use it to, to attack someone. You can use it for a defense. It cuts. 
These are all good answers. It is pointy. Well, depending on the sword, some just have a blade without a point. But yes, most of the time you can use them for stabbing. So a sword is useful for all those reasons. Why is a sword dangerous? Exactly the same reasons. The sword is both useful and dangerous for exactly the same reasons. And the word of God is the same way. God's holiness, his judgment, is both good and terrifying for exactly the same reasons. Because of what is being talked about in this passage. It penetrates the division between sword and spirit, the joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions. Now, that can be a really good thing, right? Because we all know that there have been times where we had thoughts and intentions where our actions appeared to the outside observer as though they were not good, but actually they were. And then there's also times where our actions to outside observers appeared to be fine when actually our intentions were not all that pure. And so the fact that God's judgment sees through all that makes it just and right and good, but it also makes it terrifying because it will uncover things that you don't want uncovered. And so this idea of a sword being a two-edged sword, keep in mind that this is an analogy that is used in other places in the gospel, for example, in Ephesians. The word of God wielding it as soldiers of Christ, which we are commanded to do, is good. But we also must be aware of the fact that it is a dangerous power as well, because it is going to be the same standard by which we ourselves are judged, by which our own actions are uh, uncovered and shown for what they really are. And so let us never forget that, that in the same way that a sword is dangerous because it is useful for the, the same reasons, the word of God has those same qualities as well. And with God, I think the reason that it is even scarier and the reason that this sort of symbolism is being used here is because we understand that God is actually perfect. Like, we're not being judged by another human being because that's scary enough, right? It would be scary if it's in the very formal sense of, like, we're on trial for a crime we committed or if it's just, you know, somebody judging our actions. That's a scary thing to have to deal with. But at least we know that the other person is also flawed and has problems and might be able to, you know, somewhat empathize with our plight because of that. God doesn't have any of those things. Yes, he is wise. Yes, he sees all things, but he is also perfect. He has no sin. And because of that, standing in judgment before a just God is terrifying. Um, this idea of everything being laid bare before him. Well, that's something that scares us as humans and should, right? I mean, the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they realized they were sinned, they realized they were naked. Why? Why is that important? Why, why would that be correlated with one another? Because they understood they were vulnerable. That's what happened when they partook of the, the knowledge of good and evil, once they had knowledge of evil, they realized, I'm vulnerable. Things can happen to me. And that's what happens when we stand before God when our conscience is not innocent, that we understand that we are vulnerable and that we are going to be judged. And that's why this concept is, is terrifying. But here's the answer to that. And we'll pick up in verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need." See, that concept we were just talking about, which is very real, that we are one day going to stand in judgment before a God that knows every single thing that we've done right down to the thoughts that we've had and the intentions of our heart, is coupled with this idea of, but we will also have a high priest there. And not a high priest that is far and distant away, but a great high priest who has lived as a person. He's, not, he's still without sin, don't get me wrong. That is still a quality that he maintains, however... He knows what it's like to be tempted. He's felt hunger and thirst. He knows what it's like to be really tired. And so these are all things that he has actually experienced firsthand. And so while we do have a perfect judge, we also have a judge that has walked a mile in our shoes.
And so the Hebrew author here is juxtaposing those two ideas that, yes, we're going to have a terrifying time standing in that judgment seat. But when we are faced with that judgment, we are also going to have a high priest that understands us. And this is an idea that is extremely unique to Christianity. You know, again, we'll have sometimes scoffers that try to equate Christianity to, oh, it's just a bunch of other religions, and it was just a hodgepodge of, of religions that came before it. Not in this sense, because you think about it, when Thor came to earth and walked among people, of course, I'm saying according to their literature, not that I believe it really happened, Thor was still a god. He was still, still super strong. He could still call down lightning. He still had a magic hammer. Uh, when Osiris or, um, uh, wow, I just lost his name. Uh, when Osiris or his son, um, Horus, that was it. The Egyptian gods, when they walked on earth, which, you know, according to the stories they did, they retained all of their godlike abilities too. They were still super strong. They still had amazing foresight. They had all these abilities that humans didn't have. Hercules is the one that is usually equated to Jesus the most because he was at least half mortal, but he was still super strong and basically immortal and seemingly much more clever than everybody standing around him, and he still had the favor of the gods on his side. And so he was never really truly human either. Jesus was. He, as the Colossian writer will say, emptied himself and became human and experienced humanity. Did he have miraculous powers? Sure, but did he ever use them for himself? I don't recall any instance where he used his miracles to do himself. In fact, the one time that that idea is brought up, he rejects it and says no. And so he experienced with fullness what it was like to be a human. And as this passage points out, he is a high priest, which means he is the one who, just like the high priest of old times, passes through the veil to be directly in God's presence. That's what happened on the Day of Atonement is the high priest, the one time a year he could go and approach God's presence in the Holy of Holies. He would walk past the veil and he would enter God's presence to offer a sacrifice. That's exactly what Jesus did for us, except instead of the physical temple here on earth, he did it in the spiritual temple. He passed through actual death, made himself a sacrifice, and stood directly in God's presence to offer atonement for our sins. And in that sense, we have been vouched for in God's literal presence, his actual spiritual dwelling place, which cannot be said of any other high priest that has ever lived. And this idea about him having been a high priest that has dealt with temptation, there's a fantastic analogy that is given by C.S. Lewis about this. Not only did Jesus understand temptation, that he was, like this verse says, tempted in all ways, He's actually been tempted more than any other human being that has ever lived. First of all, we really don't have to look any further philosophically than the, the trials that he went through when Satan tempted him, right? Because we know for a fact that he could have turned those rocks into bread. We know for a fact he could have cast himself off of the temple and he would have been lifted up by the angels. And we also know that he, if he had bowed down and worshipped Satan, Satan would have given it to him because he had the rest of the world if, if Jesus was lost anyway, so what did it matter to him? And so he had all those temptations that we've never had to deal with. And the analogy that Lewis gives here is he says, does a man understand the strength of the tide when he allows himself to be washed away by it or when he stands against it? It's when he stands against it, right? It's when he stands firm and wants to not be moved by a wave that he can actually feel the full force of what that wave is. He's the one that actually understands its power, not the person that just kind of floats along on an inner tube, because they're not resisting. Well, Jesus is the only one that lived his whole life without ever giving in to sin, which means he's also the only man that ever existed that felt the full weight of sin. We feel a lot of it, but at a certain point, all of us, at one time or another, we give in to it. We just let it wash over us. Jesus never let that happen for the entire 33 years that he was here on earth. And so he doesn't just understand sin to the level that we do. He understands temptation better than any of us. And that is the advocate that we have going to God and making our case before him. That's why we can go and approach the throne of grace confidently. 
because that is the person we have in our corner. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll get to chapter five next week. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.